Good morning, God's people. Why don't we stand? Praise the Lord. Hello and welcome to our Sunday morning service and happy Father's Day to all the fathers here uh, joining us this morning and happy Father's Day to all those that would be, would be watching online. You know, today is a day that has been set aside nationally to just recognize and honor fathers. And uh, as fathers, we, we appreciate that. We appreciate that special day, even as uh, our wives, uh, mothers, uh, had their uh, day uh, last month. But I was just thinking that this, this uh, honor and recognition for fathers that comes once a year, praise God for that. But you know what? We have a heavenly father, and we honor and recognize him. Praise the Lord. So we should, with, with thankful and grateful hearts, just lift up our hearts and our and open ourselves to, to what our Heavenly Father has for us this morning. Amen, God's you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for, Lord, even this day, Lord Jesus, Father, this Father's Day, Lord, and Lord, again, that we just want to acknowledge you, Lord, Father, your goodness, Lord, your, your, your mercy, your compassion, your loving kindness, Lord, Father, your protection, Lord, your covering. But Lord, we ask all of this right now, Lord, here uh, with us this morning. So, Father, you just move through your spirit. You touch, you encourage your people, your children. And, Lord, you just, Father, just be blessed, Lord, in our honor and our worship and our praise unto you. So we just thank you this morning in your precious name. Amen. Let's worship God's people. Oh, 
Thank you this morning. You are more than enough. And we just give you thanks and praise even on Father's Day, Lord. You are our Heavenly Father. And we just praise and magnify and extol your name this morning, Lord. And just pray you be here with all of us as we're gathered, Lord, and those who are tuned in to receive this word, Father. You, you just have your way in this place, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Smile through your mask. Just because we can't gather together uh, like we uh, did just a few months ago doesn't mean that uh, the church is idle and that uh, we've stopped doing things. I'm not sure how many of you have uh, seen the uh, notice that we're having a virtual uh, VBS, praise the Lord. Um, the uh, dates for the uh, VBS are July 6th through uh, July 10th and that is entirely online. Uh, you can find the video on YouTube with instructions on how to sign up. Uh, there's also a QR code printed out and taped on the table near the exit so that you can scan after service to, to sign up. We're trying to make this as easy as possible for, for you to be able to be a part of the VBS. Each day of VBS, there will be uh, different messages and activities. All supplies will be provided in a VBS kit. There you go, little backpack for the for the little ones, praise the Lord. Or a big lunch bag for the big ones, I'm not sure. <laughs> Multi-use backpack, praise the Lord. Uh, VBS kits can be picked up after service on Sunday, July 5th. This is free of charge. So uh, this is to uh, each uh, of uh, us as family members and not just us as the church, but those that we know, friends and neighbors and, and um, children, grandchildren, so it's open to everyone. Um, technical support will be provided, so don't let technology keep you away. Praise the Lord, praise God. And this morning I also have uh, a letter from Pastor Mike. He desired to be here, but uh, his, his heart and his thoughts are in this letter. It's uh, dated uh, today, Sunday, June 21st, 2020. And it says, good morning, brethren. I would like to begin by first saying happy Father's Day to all of you fathers and soon to be fathers. Today, we also celebrate the memory of someone who was the spiritual father to so many of us. Three years ago on Father's Day, our founding pastor, Ray Gonzalez, went home to be with Jesus. Though we are all still brokenhearted and miss our pastor, we know that the Lord still has much work for us to do, amen, uh, before we see him again. I had truly hoped I would be able to be with you on this special day, but out of an abundance of caution, I have decided to stay away until I receive my negative test results. Please understand that it's very difficult for me not to be there with you, brethren, especially on a day like today. But Lord willing, both my wife and I will be with you next Sunday morning. Thank you all so much for being there this morning, and thank you again for all of your prayers. Happy Father's Day, and always remember, God is still on the throne. Pastor Mike, praise the Lord. So, uh, for those of you that have been um, following uh, Pastor Mike's messages, you know that his heart just longs and yearns to be here. And he, he feels so, so terribly bad that he can't. But even as, as I read and how Pastor Mike stated that out of an abundance of caution for you, his flock, he's decided to 
refrain from being here any earlier than what we're considered to be safe to do so. So as much as Pastor Mike wants to be here, he feels for the safety of all of you, as well as uh, uh, for himself and his family, he's decided to forego being here uh, this, this morning. So Lord willing, again, uh, he hopes that uh, he'll get his uh, test results. He feels good, he feels strong. If you saw him uh, this past Wednesday, he looks really good. You would uh, never know that anything was wrong with him, but again, just erring on the side of uh, caution, uh, Lord willing, Pastor Mike will be here uh, next morning. So then with that, uh, Brother Regis will be serving the word this morning, and I'm going to call Brother Regis forward. Brother Regis. Thanks, Brother Marco. Good morning. Um, I know we don't add it anything to scripture, but um, that's like um, the second letter from Pastor Mike to the Church of the Rock Church. You know, it feels like I know he loves the Apostle Paul, and we just uh, run in and how the Apostle Paul's like, hey, you guys, I wanted to be with you, Corinthians, and I couldn't be with you, and stuff's holding me up. And so as, as you were reading that, it reminded me of um, the letter to the churches, and so that's your our second letter from Pastor Mike this morning, and hopefully they'll just be like two letters, that's it, right? So Pastor Mike, Sister Susan at home, I don't know if you guys are watching live on Facebook, but we love you guys. He didn't want us to um, FaceTime him this morning, but I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to make their phones blow up throughout the day and just blow them up with text and just let them know that you love them a lot, okay? So that he doesn't feel like we don't want him back. Because <laughs> we want him back, like, really soon, right? And his wife, too. And um, just encourage them in that way. And I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure everybody is already, so I'm just, you know, a reminder. So good morning to everybody. Good morning, children of God. It says in 1 John 3.14, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called His children. Given to us that we should be called His children. And today's message is, You have the best dad. You have the best dad. Let's turn around to the person next to them and tell them, say, You know what? You have the best dad. You have the best dad. Amen. Father's Day, like um, Pastor uh, Brother Marco was sharing, was inaugurated in the United States in the earliest 20th century, of course, to complement Mother's Day and celebrating fathers, fathering, and fatherhood. It was founded in Spokane, Washington at the YMS. Sonora Smart God, who was born in Arkansas. Its first celebration was in the YMCA on June 19, 1910. Her father was a Civil War veteran. His name was William Jackson Smart. He was a single parent who raised his six children there. One was an infant after his wife had died. After hearing a sermon, but sermon about Anna Jarvis's Mother Day, at Central Methodist Episcopal Church, she told her pastor that fathers should have a similar holiday honoring them. Fifth, that was her father, said that he didn't have enough time to prepare a sermon for her fathers. So the celebration was deferred until the third Sunday of June. Initially, it didn't have much success, but in the 1920s, Dodd stopped promoting the celebration because she was studying school. And soon the celebration of fathers faded away. But in 1930, she returned to her hometown and started promoting the celebration again, raising awareness of fathers on a national level. She had the help of those trade groups that would benefit most from the holiday. For example, during that time, manufacturers of ties. Anybody get a tie for Father's Day before? Tobacco pipes, anybody get a tobacco pipe for Father's Day? You don't have to raise your hands, okay? And, and so it started gaining momentum. And after finally much to do in 1972, not that long ago, President Richard Nixon signed the public law that made it a permanent holiday. So for 
companies, they had ulterior motives. But for this young woman, she wanted to honor her dad who loved her and raised her. And I bet she felt that she had the best dad in the world. Okay, good. How many men here have had fathers? Raise your hand. Like it or not, have had a father in your life? Raise your hand. See, we got a lot in common here today, right? Let's open up to a very familiar in Luke chapter 15. And today, as we look at these verses that the story that Jesus told, that's timeless, that's been shared about so many times, we're going to look at three areas in these scriptures and verses. Before we do that, I want to ask you a couple questions. When you think of or when you hear the word Father, what do you think of? I mean, what do you feel in your heart? What is it in your mind that goes on? My dad's the best. My dad was great. My dad was an angry man. My dad's gone. I never knew my dad. My dad was so... And another question is this. Kids yet, little, you guys sitting in the front here, man, listen to me, everybody. You, one day you'll be fathers. Ask yourself this question. Are you the kind of dad that will be missed? Am I the kind of dad that when I'm gone, my family, my kids, they will miss me? They will think of me fondly and they will say, man, my dad was so cool. He loved us so much. He was perfect in every way. <laughs> he was not perfect in every way. But when he wasn't, he realized it and made it right. Will you be missed? What kind of dad will you be? We need to think of it before that happens. And if we are there right now, God can work in my life and in our lives every day in this area. And in these passages, we're going to look at the Father heart of God. We're going to look at three areas in these passages of Scripture, three attributes that are here. And there's so much that can be pulled from this story that Jesus said. But one is we're going to look at the kind of father that God is. He's patient, generous, giving, and forgiving. And we're going to look at the kind of fathers that we should be and we should want to be. Patient, giving, and forgiving. And we're also going to hopefully look at the kind of family that God wants us to be. Patient, forgiving. Patient, giving, and forgiving in these three areas. Father, we just thank you today so much that we just have this radical privilege and honor that it, as we turn on, that you call us your children. Today, we just pray, God, I pray that each person here today, each one of us and each person watching, Lord, at home, would just realize what a loving Heavenly Father you are. God, that today we would just honor you, Lord, and that we would also, as men, become the kind of people that you have called us to be, Lord. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would be here now, and all God's people pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's read these verses, and then let's dig into them. So... In verse 11, 
Jesus was speaking to religious, hypocritical people, Pharisees, and he told them this story to illustrate the heart of God and the kind of heart that he wants us to have. And he told them, well, there was a certain man in verse 11, he had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falls to me. And so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And when he had spent all or everything, there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. Verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? I perish with hunger. Verse 18, he decides what he's going to do about his situation. He said, I will arise and go to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. And so in this first part right here, we see that there was a man and two brothers. One was the, the older brother, one was the younger brother. And we see here that the son, the younger, went to his dad and said, Dad, give me what belongs to me. I want what I have coming to me, the inheritance. Give me what's mine. I want it now. Which is really a weird thing because usually when does somebody get an inheritance? Think about it. Yeah, when your mom or dad die, right? I mean, if you have a mom and dad and let's say they have a house and they bought it 40, 50 years ago and it's paid for and, and they die. The de say the dad dies. You go to the mom and say, sell me the house now. I want the money because I, I want to move up. We want to pay some bills off, buy a new car and move into a new place. No, he, we don't say that, like, mom's going to die soon, and then we'll get everything, right? You wait till the parents are gone. You don't say, give it to me now. You don't do that. It's not right. It's not right to do that. I mean, you know, we don't do This is what the younger son did, the audacity that he had. This sense of give me, give me, give me. The sense of entitlement that we can have even today, you know? Give me, give me, give me what belongs to me. Did it really belong to that? Son didn't work for it. But we see here the father heart of God, even in his reaction and throughout the scriptures. If, if my kids came to me and said that, first of all, I'd be like, <laughs> I don't got Maybe in a few years, if you want this old suburban, you can have it, you know? Like, I really got not much to give you. I'm sorry. That's kind of the day and age that we live in. But if I did have money and if I was this dad, I would have been like, what is wrong with you? You're saying you want me, you'd rather have me dead so you can have my stuff? You ungrateful, son. You're so entitled. Get out of here. That would have been me. Maybe that would have been, we see here, it's so easy to get angry. It's so easy to give the wrong thing. You know, my daughter's trying to help me. Instead of just being grateful that she's trying to help me, I'm getting frustrated and angry. You're not doing it right. Hold it like this, do this. Where's your brother? God's not like that with us. 
You don't understand his grace and mercy. I don't understand how he could respond like this. What he was asked of was wrong in mercy. Even though his son didn't deserve it, he was giving and generous with his son. And we see through the scripture that it, it was at a great cost. I mean, the kid took half of what the family owned. It cost reputation of the family. You know, the kids' reactions reflect on the families. The dad looked like a weakling, probably. He's like, you know, with these, with his respected friends, he's like, oh, I can't believe you just gave it to him like that. I would have said, Lee, get out of here. Maybe the dad thought, well, that's what I wanted to say too, but my wife was like, you can't do that. But that's not the Lord. He doesn't have a wife. He's like, no, that's my child. I love them. And we don't understand. And it costs great resources for the family. Half of the livelihood. It probably costs a lot of chaos in the family trying to divide up stuff and figure out, well, how are we going to do this? I mean, how are we going to cut the cows in half? What are we going to do? Who are we going to sell this stuff to? And there was great cost to relationships. Because when we act out in, in this selfishness like this, it hurt the family. It hurt the relationship the, the son and the father had. It hurt the relationship that the brothers had together. We'll see that in a little bit. And, and it hurt the relationship that the son had with the people in the household and the servants. So we see that God is a very loving, patient, and giving God. How would you respond as a father, as a parent, in this situation? In anger? No way? In Psalm 145, 8, it says that God is slow to anger and rich in mercy and compassion. Selfishness, sin, costs greatness to everyone. And like this, we'll see that it's it's a waste of time, resources, relationship, and life. Question, are there any gifts that we're wasting? God's great mercy in giving us what we don't deserve. Now in the second part, we saw that the son went away and he was where he spent everything that was given to him and he went into a far country and it says that um, in verse 15 he joined himself to another a citizen of that country that's the job he got but we see in verse uh, 13 that he wasted his possessions with prodigal living that just means reckless living reckless living just kind of doing whatever in life and you think about how many people today or living their life like that. People are looking for purpose. People are looking to be loved and accepted. And they're not finding it necessarily in the world or even in their families. And many of us here, we do have love and we do have purpose and acceptance. Some people came, we all came from this, you know, where we're looking for something in life. But what do we see here? In verse 16, no one gave him anything. And I have to paint this picture because today this message isn't about the prodigal son coming to the Lord. It's about the father that loves us. He loves you and I. We need to understand this because the way we see God oftentimes is the way that you see your earthly father. Part of the reason why I see God as a loving heavenly father it, through scripture, through um, his forgiveness and his grace in my life is also because I have 
earthly fathers that love me and show me the heart of God, His attributes. I have my dad that loves me the way God loves me. He's not perfect. I have a father-in-law that shows me the kind of father God is. I, I have men here that show me, leaders, the elders, pastor, men that show me. And it's not always easy. You know, we have a brother here that didn't, didn't really grow up with the dad or mom. And you'd be like, man, his kids are messed up. They're not going to have a very good father. And that, that brother, he's a good father. God came into his life, and now he's being a good father to his sons. He's showing them what God is like. So we need to see this. So one of the things that we see is while this young man is in this situation here, is that you see that in the world, the lack of love. You know, we need to have justice. If people do wrong things, there needs to be justice. There needs to be respect. But you can't change the heart of people by changing laws. Our hearts need to be changed. God needs to change my heart. He needs to put his love in me so I can love others for him. And until that happens, there's going to be selfishness. I'm going to hurt people. And you see that. The world's way is looking out for number one. Every got to make your own life. It's like the movies that came out a few years ago, the books, The Hunger Games. Anybody seen The Hunger Games a few years ago? There's a bunch of districts. And in order to, to maintain this sense of like, you know, justice and unity and all this stuff, like they pick like 13. I'm being told by 12 young people to go randomly and basically they're going to stand for their district and fight to the death. <laughs> like it's crazy, but that's really kind of how it is out there, you know, and he found this out. Fighting to the death, number one. And we see that, but while he's in this situation, he came to a place, and we talked about this last week, where he remembered how good it was at home. He remembered the kind of dad that he had at home. This started changing his attitude, and it became an attitude of gratitude, of thankfulness. And, and as he saw that, he started repenting. He started seeing his mistakes and saying, I have a situation because of my bad choices. I need to do something about it. He saw his mistakes and he started turning, and then he repeated. He, he made a conscious decision to go back, to humble himself and go make it right with his dad. And to this place in their life. Do you think they thought to themselves, man, if I do this, there is no way my dad's gonna accept me. He's gonna be like, I told you. Man, just to be like, oh, come here, I love you, I miss you. Okay, yeah, your, your old room's still there. I'm thinking if this young person felt that way in their heart and mind, they would have not come to the place where they felt like they could go back. I think the reason this son decided, I'm going to go back the kind of man his dad was. He said, if I go back and say, Dad, I'm sorry. I messed up. Dad, son, I don't deserve to be called your son. You treat our ser your servant so good. I just want to be a servant. I just want to work for you. I don't deserve anything. I believe this young person knew they had the best dad in the world. One that would open his arms up and say, son, come here. I forgive you. I receive you. We see, even in our lives, that nothing brings healing and reconciliation. Nothing brings healing and reconciliation in relationships like remorse and repentance. As Christians, I mean, you know, when you mess up, when I mess up, you know, say angry words to my kids. And if I come to a place where I see like, man, I messed up. 
I didn't show the heart of God in this situation. If I can humble myself and go to them and say, you know, I, I was really wrong. I took you for granted. I'm sorry. Tell me, how many of you would be like, <laughs> come here. I forgive you. Hey, I love you so much. I'm just so glad that you're here. So moving on to the very exciting part. This whole thing is awesome, but I just want to focus on these last verses. In verse 20, it says, So he arose and came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Dad, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer to, worthy to be called your son. You're going, shh, shh. Because the son was going to say what after that? The son was prepared to say, I just want to be one of your servants. Just bring me into the house. I'll just, you know, do whatever you want. I'll work for you. I, I'm, I'm not worthy. And I could see the dad just going, shh, shh. It's, come here. Verse 22, where the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's eat and just have a party. Let's be merry. For this son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And then they began to be married. We see that in verse 20, the son started coming back home. And here we see the father heart of God in being patient. He was patiently waiting, watching, and wanting the son to come back. This is a, a picture of trusting God, maybe of the Father working through things in his own heart. Daughter gone for a while. Maybe a daughter, you know, going to school and they're kind of late at night or, you know, your child and you haven't seen them for a while or you're just worried and they come home and you're just like, oh, I'm so glad to see you. If you were at Sam's Club, Sam Marino, probably, I don't know how many years ago, Kathy, like 15 years ago or 16 years ago. And if you're shopping and, you know, back then it wasn't all about, you know, water and toilet paper and stuff. We're just buying a bunch of clothes we didn't need and a bunch of whatever, right? Code pink and down to the store and you're like, what happened? I'm going to tell you what happened right now. Kathy and I are licking each other. It was Nina, right? And we're like, she's like. How old? Like six, seven, you know, maybe younger. And we're like, where is, where is she at? I don't see her. Wasn't she with you? No, I thought she was with you. Ah, ah. And man just ran to security or front door and told them, our daughter's missing. Our daughter's missing. My brother had this. We were like at a John's Incredible Pizza. And, and my niece, she was, you know, little and and she was gone finally we we ran out or something we're looking for her in the street we're just like, oh, Jesus. what's going on you know you're like your heart's like oh man and you're looking looking at vans looking at trucks like where's this person at where's my niece where's my daughter well where the cake and the pizza's out watching like barney or you know, first you're like, oh, that was funny. I'm so mad at you. Oh. My wife and I are scrambling around looking for a little girl. And then we're like, I'm so mad. Come here. I just want to hold you. Because, you know, you could be so mad or so angry or whatever, but then you're almost, they're almost you guys ever been that way where you're driving to church and like, you know, you and your wife maybe had, this didn't happen today, okay, because Kathy and I drove separate cars, but I'm just saying, you know, you're driving to church and something happens and it's like, you know, you're on another, <laughs> like, you know, and then all of a sudden you go 
through a green light, but somebody blows a red light and you almost both die. Your family almost just, what happens? <laughs> just, we could have lot. I'm sorry I take you for granted. Sorry. And it's like, it doesn't matter. And this son came home just like, no, oh, I'm coming home. Maybe watching the dad's this man, we don't know how old he was, but if it was the dad just like running to his son, he's like, that's my kid. And he fell on his neck and he's just kidding. This is the heart of God towards you, towards those listening that don't know him. He's waiting and watching for for us to come to him. He loves us so much. Not like me or us that maybe it's like, well, it's about time you came home. I know you'd be home eventually. And I told you so. I told you it wasn't going to be that easy. And what do you want, buddy? Nah, go with it. Right? This is the Father's heart. That he's waiting, watching, and wanting. He loves us that because he loves us so much, his son, his only son, his begotten son, that he loves so much, Jesus Christ, for you and I to make our relationship right. It says that he took him and he he put a robe on him, a ring on his hand, cap, and they killed it and said, Let's be married. Here we see scripturally the robe put on us of righteousness. This is a position. He showed you were lost. You didn't have anything. You didn't have anything. It's forgiven. The ring on his hand signifies power. Like King Darius when he sealed there. It shows power and he gave him back. Belong to me. You have the power. It's not like you're lower now. You're where you were. about it. If you go somewhere where people don't have shoes. Most often, either, what? They're hippies. <laughs> or they're poor. Poverty. And reproach and he put that on there and he said no more you have purpose now you're not purposeless and he killed the fatted calf signifying sacrifice which we know Jesus is the sacrifice for us that shows the love of God that makes us right with him that forgives our sins also the sick the sandal is a symbol of a legal contract like with Ruth and Boaz he said you're mine man you're my son and don't ever forget this. You belong here, but now you're alive. God loves us so much. He loves you, his heart. The older son we know in closing wasn't there at the house in verse 25. Now we're going to look at the last part, the kind of family that the father wants us to have. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants. He was out in the field working hard, honoring right things. Maybe thinking like, man, where's, if my brother were here, I can't believe he left. Now I'm stuck with all these extra responsibilities, all this extra stuff. And he's coming home tired. And he asked one of the servants and said, well, what's going on? What's this party all about? I wasn't invited. What's happening? And the servant said to him, Your brother, he's come home. And because he has received him safe and sound, because your dad has received him safe and sound, your father killed the fatted calf, the calf safe for a special occasion. I don't know about you, sometimes I feel like that, like God is not fair. How many parents, you have kids, where you try to do what's equitable, what's like, and so we have to treat them a little differently. It's not necessarily, how many, and how many have felt like, well, that's not fair. You let them do that thing, and you don't let me. Well, how come this, how come that? And we can have resentment grow in our hearts when we don't know the heart of the Father. This can happen. In verse 28, it says, he was angry. He was angry. He was like, what? 
He got to the house. He's tired. He wants to go in and just relax, get some water, and just rest. But he's so angry. He says he would not go in. In my heart towards others, as a father, as, towards my family, towards my children, and, and one another, what am I angry about towards others? This is the forgiving part. Maybe I have unforgiveness or hostility. I'm unmerciful. Maybe resentful. Judgmental, because later on he says, man, this son of yours was out spending time with harlots. Like, where did he get that? He doesn't know that. I mean, the scripture doesn't say that. It said he went and wasted money. I mean, I would assume so, but I'm just as judgmental as this good brother. He had this critical spirit. And we see that as his father was speaking to him in these last verses, he was prideful and arrogant. A lot of times I personally have related more to the older brother. Lord, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to be a good son. I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to be a good Christian, Lord. And uh, look at them. And you're just blessing them. And, and the Lord's like, <laughs> Regis, your heart is not like mine right now. You have these things. You're not like me. You're being unmerciful, hostile, unforgiving, resentful, critical, prideful, arrogant. So his dad came out and said to him, well, he told his dad, I've served you all these years. I haven't sinned against your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me young goat, in verse 29, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours comes home, who devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And we just see his heart. And sometimes that could be our heart towards one another and our family, towards our kids, towards your parents. My parents are so unfair. Towards people we know in our community, in our church. Towards God. Maybe some of us feel that way towards God. We're like, we have this religious kind of like, more like, legalistic relationship with him more than like the grace and forgiveness in our lives the father just shows his heart again of giving and of forgiveness he said son you're always with me and everything that i have belongs to you he's i love you so much i don't love your younger brother any more than I love you. I love you both. I, I appreciate I recognize what you've done. But I don't love you because of what you're doing. I love you because I'm the best dad. I care about you. He says, it's right that we should make Mary and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and is, was lost and is found. Three questions as we close in prayer, um, Nathan, worship team. And it was in the heart of Pastor Mike that we would pray for you as leaders. Uh, if I can ask the elders to come forward and maybe you know space yourself out. I think we all are, know what social distancing and stuff is, so if you could just come out and face the brethren. And then if, if you need prayer in any area, but specifically these three areas, if the elders could come forward. And, and, and just come and stand in front of one of the brothers here. And they'll pray with you. They, they know how to do that. But number one, as Nathan begins to play, is number one, do you know that God loves you? That he wants to be your father. He cares. For some people, he's waiting. And to trust that he will forgive you and love you. Number two, fathers and young men that aren't fathers yet. What kind of dad do you want to be? 
What kind of dad do I want to be? What kind? Maybe I have some of these things. And I need to go home and tell certain people in my family, I'm sorry. I've been short with you. I get angry easily. I'm not a good example to you about how you should treat your wife one day or whatever it is that God shows us. And number three, how is my father heart for our families? It's to just today let you know prayer in one of these three areas. If you need to accept um, Jesus into your life or any of these areas today, maybe you're hurting, maybe your earthly father let you down and you've never let that go. God wants to heal you. So we're going to pray right now. Father, we just pray as we have this altar call that today, Lord, that you would heal broken hearts, that you would bring people to you here and watching, Lord, live or online. God, that we would come to know that you are the best dad in the world. You are, Father, the one that we want to be like. Today, may your Holy Spirit be here in Jesus' name. sure it was for each of us and we appreciate that what a father we have almighty God and as we close in prayer let's take that message uh, with us and we pray that each of you have a blessed day today and you find and uh, let's thank you Lord again for your presence your people that you made this possible God you bless brother Regis his wife and family we again lift up Pastor Mike, Sister Susan, and all the family, Lord, to continue to do a work. We thank you that we can call you Abba Father, for you are precious, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do, that you may be glorified. We, we seek you in all things, and we ask for answered prayers. Bless your people, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful day you have given us in your presence. In Jesus' precious name. And the congregation said, Amen.